get as close to my mouth, I guess. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes? Okay, great. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, Wayne and Porson, our visiting lecturer, has uh, a nice set of uh, slides and things to share with you, so I'm going to make my introduction uh, relatively brief so that uh, Raina can, can get to the, uh, the heart of the matter. Uh, our visiting lecturer today, Raina Porson, is from uh, Denmark. She studied architecture at Arts in uh, Denmark and then at the Polytechnic. University of uh, Polytechnic University in uh, Barcelona, and uh, then she, about seven years ago, moved to Mexico, was the uh, director of planning for the city of Monterrey, Mexico, for three or four years, and then for the last three years has been a professor of architecture at the uh, Tech de Monterrey in Monterrey, Mexico. Tech de Monterrey is the mother uh, schools of the uh, network consortium of uh, universities around Mexico, probably 29 and 30 universities uh, spread throughout uh, Mexico, and the, uh, the uh, lead uh, campuses in Mexico is in Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, Reina is here as uh, part of the North American Sustainability Housing and Community Consortium, which we formed with universities in Mexico and Canada. And uh, one of the other kind of uh, things that about grown out of that consortium, for those of you who had the opportunity Friday at noon, a couple of uh, students from uh, Landscape Architecture, Alan Byler and uh, Patrick Peterson, will be uh, sharing images and experiences from the semester of uh, self-directed uh, foreign studies that they did in Mexico. Uh, working with the uh, faculty there of the consortium uh, that took them all the way from uh, Ball State to, uh, to Guatemala. And they'll be uh, presenting that at, uh, at noon on uh, this coming Friday and back to the end as well. With that, I will turn the floor over to Ray. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. No, it doesn't work. Wait a second. It's supposed to be working. It's not working, is it? No. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and um, it's a pleasure and it's an honor for me to be addressing you this afternoon. I would like, first of all, to thank you for this and your colleagues for this very, very beautiful welcome you have given me to the Wall State University. Um, I realized when I was preparing my trip to go to Wall State University that to talk about community to you is going to be very, very difficult because you already have some very strong programs uh, on that, on that, that issue. What I would like to do whatsoever would be to talk a little bit about the meaning of, or what for me is the meaning of community, what is the sense of community, uh, and also to show you a little bit about the differences of communities uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, if you have any questions during my lecture, feel free to interrupt. It doesn't have to be so formal talk a little bit about it also and I would be like very interested to hear your experience about community also because I I tend to think that it has to be very different from different parts of the world. Um, so I'll slow down the lights. Okay, let's, here we go. Um, I think it's important to discuss a little bit the meaning of, of community. It's about likeness, it's about fellowship, it's about different scales of community. It's about things being in common. Uh, and of course, it's something 
that is that's in un to be uni united, uh, a group of people. Uh, community, I think, I believe, is the first virtual space that we know. I think it goes back from forever. Um, that's a way of auto-protection of common survivance. Uh, there are many ways um, of uh, aspects of community and many ways to arrange such a community. Uh, it doesn't stand alone and it fits along with cultural, economical and legal aspects of society. Um, it's, it's most of the time it's about a dream, being together, being a student community, being playing around. And it can also be city communities, like the, these examples of the garden cities in the 1960s. In the, in the I'm sorry, <laughs> in the 1900s in Europe. Uh, it can also be a protest, like in some part of Europe, they have made this sort of uh, protest communities to try to live uh, in a way different from the other parts of society. Lately, community has come into fashion, even in parts n known for its very individualistic lifestyle, such as the city of Monterey, because it presents to us this topical dream of um, returning back to the beautiful and uncomplicated life uh, of, of the places. Of course, what it truly is, is that it's a way of selling new houses um, based on different things. Could be people's fear, uh, the fear of the wrong neighbors, the need for, the extreme need for privacy, etc. But it's very seldom, at least in my city, uh, a real need to create new communities. Um, There has, like I, I started to say, there has been uh, communities forever. When you see uh, the National Geographic, you see this type of ethnological studies where they show these very idyllic uh, communities. Uh, and they have been always important places for um, trying to describe, to exchange information, goods, and knowledge. Um, and generally, at least in Europe, well, you have various communities to create bigger societies. Um, of course, uh, this, is, this is a picture of of one of these protest communities that I mentioned to you, it's in Copenhagen, and it was a sort of illegal settlement of old military facilities, and people started doing rebuilding of the area for, for housing on reusing materials. It was started in the 1960s, and since it was started, uh, there has been a huge discussion uh, if to relocate these people or letting them stay, and they're still living there. And this part, Christiania, has now become a huge touristical attraction <laughs> for the city. Now they make it sort of like bus trips and places like that. Um, but for, for many years, it was like, like political questions with every elections. Uh, whether it should stay or whether it should go. Uh, I don't really have the, the clear answer to the question, but it's really funny because in this area, I mean, in this leftover military facilities around here, oh, they just moved out the Royal Academy of Architecture, and they're actually being the neighbors to this area right now, some very beautiful areas. And this is sort of the, the historical pictures of Europe, of these very 
uh, beautiful society that of course now are almost like museums. Um, um, in, in Europe, obviously also, it has been used as a social factor uh, in the sense of trying to, to use the smaller community as a help, as a way of information, uh, because uh, some two or three hundred years ago, the, the country life was very common and it was very isolated. So the community was used to be able to have a sort of leisure time outside the daily hard work. Uh, it's, it's, you should remember that in those days, it was very hard to travel and it was really uh, a really hard life. So they were using small community blocks to get a, a, a sort of away from that. And also later on, it was used as an, as an educational factor in order to, to try to bring a general education into the population. Um, this, this community obviously turned very strongly. You can read uh, in, in a, an example of that in the Babette's feast of Isaac Dinesen. She describes one of these fishermen's communities in the late 19th centuries in Denmark very close, very narrow-minded, and very, very difficult for strangers to live in. Because at that time, it was extremely difficult uh, to change. The people generally lived in the same place uh, or in the same type of community for the whole life. Um, another uh, important, uh, sorry, uh, being so much impossible and you had to really follow the rules of the community. And one of the hardest things that could happen to most people was to be excluded from their communities. Uh, it would be a truly hard punishment. Uh, one of another famous example is of course the Robin Hood that is giving the sort of idyllic picture of being a lawless uh, of having to live outside the community. I'm absolutely sure that the reality of this was, was quite different and that was, it was al almost impossible to survive without the help of the communities. Um, talking about community, uh, I think that another important place, uh, another, another important factor has been the place and connecting place with plaza. If you see uh, any, any picture from, from old Europe, uh, you have this central part, which is a church. Uh, and as the professors here uh, specialized in history, of course, will know that, that the central plaza was crucial to these places. To these communities. Here are examples of the studies on Gordon Collen of the townscapes of the Italian plazas with, with all this type of small community spaces inside, inside the walls. You have to remember that the Middle Age city in Europe, uh, almost all of them had walls surrounding them uh, in order to protect them from the outside. Uh, in, in all community, there is uh, a huge point of the protection from the outside. It's a group of people who wants the same thing. Um, nevertheless, what I think, and I'll talk about it uh, finally in this lecture, I think that this, this thing is changing. Uh, I think that we are going to be knowing, or we are already knowing, that these meeting places that look so very beautiful in these sketches are going to be much more virtual in our lifetime. And that is a, a true, true change in community discussions. Um, 
the scale is also an issue to be discussed, but much more difficult. Uh, you can have a, a community like in the, the universe of Kurt Vonnegut called the Nation of Two, which is one of the, the most beautiful description of a love relationship I have, I have read. Or you can have a, n a community of a new dream, of a new, new country, uh, of a new state, like is the, uh, the city, the town, the city, Brasilia, of Oscar Niemeyer in Brazil, which is this, let's cre create a new community, a new way of understanding our culture, our life, and the way we live. Uh, curiously, we always see the same pictures. Uh, I would love to see some pictures from all these new parts that has been added to, to Brasilia, especially because this, this part didn't work so much on the human scale of, of, of the communities. Uh, it's also, well, difficult to talk about the communities and not talking about these uh, political issues of community, like in the project of Chantigar de Le Corbusier in India, which, which is the same uh, type of project like Brasilia, that it's sort of the hope, the dreams of creating a new tomorrow for a large community of people that suffered a lot from, from the British uh, government. Uh, this also extremely beautiful project in Bath in England, uh, much older, with a very interesting relationship with the nature very interesting relationship between the inside and the outside. And which, for me, until 9-11, uh, was the ultimate community project of our times, the United Nations of New York. Uh, I think that we might see a, a much a more contemporary unity projects community when we see the next projects of, of New York lately, uh, later this, oh, I'm sorry. I'll just have to change this manually. It'll be only a second, please. Do you have any questions or any comments? Don't hesitate to... From Denmark? Yes, I'm from Denmark. So you'll have the whole presentation backwards. <laughs> I'm so sorry for this. Yeah, okay, let's try to get back. Okay. Um, I think that it's also very difficult to make communities if you don't have a certain amount of density. Um, I think it's crucial uh, when we talk, uh, we discuss it a lot in Monterey because we have a city of three million to four million inhabitants all living in single family houses. And we're really talking about why they don't have 
um, why we don't have a rich urban life and, and a very rich urban community. And I always am convinced that it has to do with not having any type of density looking, looking like this part because it's just too, too cozy to be inside your own house. You don't have to go out to experience other parts of the city. You can also have, I mean, you can have a bright variety of communities. You can have the sort of university community, like you're living here in Ball State, or in this example, the University of Aarhus in Denmark. Uh, a little bit on the scale, and also to be playing around with what is happening. I mean, this is the work of an, a, sc a sculptor from Spain called Miguel Navarro, uh, talking about these huge areas that we live in, be in between the buildings. Of course, these are sort of, uh, how do you say it? Um, well, vertical, horizontal sculptures, uh, but it gives, I think, a very good ideas of, of the community's problems in these many European cities today, because the things you would be seeing going to Europe would a lot of time be the central parks, parts and not so much the, the new parts of the cities. Um, having talked a little bit about the community in general, I will now pass to talk about uh, three community types. One is in Denmark, the other one is of Spain, and the last one will be of Monterrey in Mexico. Just so that we get situated, this is Denmark. It has border with Germany and it's next to Sweden. And we have Spain around 2,000 kilometers south of Denmark. Uh, obviously, the central part of Europe is a part of the highest density and the, the highest mix of cultures and everything. Uh, but I have chose these two places because I was born in Denmark and I lived in Spain. Uh, so th those are the places I know better. This is Denmark. Here is the capital. This, the capital of Denmark is Copenhagen. Uh, it's a city of one million inhabitants. The whole country has five million inhabitants. Um, I studied here in Aarhus, and I was born here in a small village uh, just by the sea. Denmark uh, is, is a society which is agricultural based. Uh, all the wealth of Denmark comes from agriculture uh, production uh, of one or another part. Uh, there is no sorts of mining or other natural resources that has been able to contribute to the wealth of the country. So we're basically uh, a country of farmers. We all have a very strong relationship uh, with uh, communities with living in small uh, societies, small communities. Uh, the whole society, the whole country is based on, on community uh, related with the, the, the living environments. But it comes out in very different uh, ways. This is an example uh, from Copenhagen called Belahoy. It's made between 1944 and finished in 1955. And it's sort of the first high rising houses in Denmark, uh, sort of a contribute to the new era, uh, very inspired by the United States. But inside these high rise buildings, uh, they all have some 
very strong common facilities. They share uh, places to, to laundry, to have parties, and a lot of, uh, of other facilities besides the single family uh, uh, departments. Um, but uh, in, in relationship to my, to my study group here, as you can see the outside is just this huge uh, esplanade of, of green grass and nothing really happens there. There's no community in the outside. It all happens inside each building. But you also have uh, the, the, the contemporary local attempts to try to create small communities uh, in a lot of places in, in Denmark. This is uh, an example from the 60s, uh, and it looks, and it really looks really strange, the, the sort of the, the context of this project. But the city was, is here. There's an existing city of so 100,000 inhabitants. Um, and the city was supposed to grow until this part. And this project was supposed to stop the city growth. Uh, it was also supposed to be as very, very l much longer. Uh, but I think it's a beautiful example of how to create more livable areas inside the, the urbanization. Another attempt of, of local planning. As you can see, the, the, the official planning in Denmark has been looking in the 90s, 80s and 90s into much more three-dimensional planning in order to make uh, spaces, to make small community spaces inside huge living areas. This uh, this is a famous project for various reasons. It's in Copenhagen. Copenhagen is that way, and this way is, is a sea. So this project was supposed to also form a wall uh, between the nature and the sea and, and this huge uh, area of, of uh, living facilities uh, inside this small cluster housing, you have this context with much more human scale for playing around here. The problem of this project is the size. It's a huge, huge project. I don't know how many thousands of, of, of flats you have here, but the size has been too much in order to get to these small housing courtyards to be working because people don't have time to get to know each other. Uh, and it has also been used as housing, quick, cheap housing for uh, immigrants coming up from Turkey. So that it has been converted into a huge ghetto of people from other cultures coming to Denmark. Um, uh, this, this has been people generally from a, from a Muslim background and coming to Denmark uh, in a cold climate, dark winters, and very mm, reserved people is of obviously a cultural shock. And then to be put inside this environment to be living has to create, has created some huge problems. But the project as a prototype, I think is beautiful. I mean, I think it's a, it's a beautiful example of how you can work on a local scale and an urban scale uh, at the same time. The problem is that it's, it's too big. It's too ambitious. And having learned from that type of mega projects the new project that is made in Denmark uh, try to make, make a lot smaller and to make uh, small clusters 
so that you try to get the small communities, uh, even though the, 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 the plan is a lot, the project is a lot bigger. And to make this out of small living facilities where you, you get to know your neighbor, you get to salute him or her every morning, because it has worked uh, well in Denmark. But we had to pass on the other experience with these huge areas before that. I would also like to tell you, to present you a few uh, slides of a special kind of, of living areas. These are totally clustered areas uh, where you have this very interesting relationship between the inside and the outside. And these communities uh, have been very popular because it has, I mean, it has good help from government f uh, financing, but it also has a very high um, incorporation of the inhabitants of, of these living facilities. So uh, you ha if you want to live there, you have to want to participate in a number of activities for the community. Uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot say that you don't want to do that. You have to uh, eat together once a week, for instance, and be very active in the way the place uh, develops. These places, um, uh, th these are two different projects, uh, but it has worked in the sense of it has uh, created living facilities in parts uh, of the country uh, where you would normally see this one single family sprawl all over the place. So it sort of made it much more dense uh, and it has become safe uh, communities and very, mm, I mean, sometimes more problematic than others, but uh, in general it has been a success. And I think it has been a very interesting uh, example. What am I doing? Oh. No. No, it was just a question. Oh, sorry. Um, I, didn't mean to, I was just curious, with some of those developments, are those developed by the government or are they developed by private they are, they are developed by private developers, but with government funding. Uh, the, the funding of housing in Denmark is very complicated uh, because uh, in general, the government has been trying to provide uh, a, an owned house for every family. Uh, and there is various ways of doing that. One of them is that you pay less taxes if you have a mortgage uh, or you have direct uh, government funding if, uh, if you make this sort of very community-based living areas. What I've shown you so far has been an example of those small uh, living area developments and small communities. Uh, when we talk about Spain, uh, you have Barcelona here, Valencia, uh, Malaga, Sevilla, and Madrid. Uh, you have a very different way of making communities we're now heading into the Mediterranean areas. Um, we're into uh, cities of much higher density, uh, much more classic cities, like we all know from, from histories, history books. Um, in, in Spain, and especially in Barcelona, the community is developing not in relationship with the, in relation with the 
living facilities as much as the urban spaces. This is uh, some photos from Plaza Real in Barcelona. Here you have Las Ramplas. The sea is down here, the Mediterranean. And if you don't know it's here, it's very easy to pass by and never enter in this space. But once inside this, this space, it opens up a whole world of, of different ways of living together. It's like an urban theater. It's like a scene where you develop uh, all your relationships, uh, your civic relationship. Uh, the same happens in Las Ramplas. I don't have a photo from that very stupidly, but that's the fact. But the Ramblas is, is a very interesting place because it changes in all hours of the day. In the morning, you have the mothers uh, bringing their children to the school. In the afternoon, you have the couples strolling down the Ramblas. Uh, in the night, you have the friends going out for dinner. And late at night, uh, after midnight, it's uh, like the place where you, you hang out. So it has different ways of, of expressing itself through all the day. Um, it's another picture of, of the Plaza Real. And for some reason, there's not a lot of people in this picture, but it's normally uh, these, pl these places would be filled with, with all types of people. Uh, and that is where there is much more living together. There's more uh, urban spaces, much more than in relationship with, with the housing. Uh, this is the uh, Museum of Contemporary Early Art in Barcelona of Richard Mayer. And it's a, it's a new project, and in front of there, make this, made, they made this big urban space in order to, to get together, to meet. Um, in general, uh, during the time of, of Franco, uh, there was huge problems of, of meetings. Uh, it was prohibited uh, to meet in public spaces, uh, being a group of people. So in Barcelona, they developed uh, this, you cannot see it actually, but it's, it's, a, it's a local dance form called Sardanas. Uh, the people would meet uh, on the weekends in the plazas and do small dances. They still do, uh, luckily now, it's, it's for fun, it's for leisure but it's a way of, of meeting people and exchanging experiences. Uh, and I think it's, it was one, uh, one of the things that I liked about Barcelona, keeping these traditions around the public spaces. They have not changed it, changed them for, I think, hundreds of years. Uh, and they have been able to unroll them also in, in the new projects. The third country I'm going to talk about is, is, is a different, it's a different place. It's Mexico and it's Monterey. Uh, I would like to say that Monterey is not the beautiful part of Mexico. It's not that uh, very cultural, historic part of, of ancient Mexico that you would know from your history books. This is, this is modern Mexico with all the problems uh, and all, all the strange mixings, old and new, uh, central, local, old fashioned, ultra modern. And it's about flows. Uh, Monterey has uh, nine local governments inside the metropolitan area. Uh, and the oldest part is this. My university is this one. 
uh, and it's surrounded by a huge number of beautiful mountains. Uh, this is the most famous one called El Cerro de la Silla because of the shape, there's horse saddle. Uh, and this is the southern part of the city. So you can see that it's almost exclusively single housing family. Those small breaks you see here are because of small rivers crossing the city and the fluid of the streets, the uh, avenues. This is Tech de Monterey here. And of course, these majestic surroundings are very impressive, but we're not, we don't use them a lot. In fact, we are known not to use uh, our huge potential for community spaces and especially public spaces. This is the river, Santa Catarina, across the whole city. And it, it, this is where the water normally runs. But once every 40 years, it gets filled uh, with water. Uh, so the government has chosen not to use it, which is really complicated in a city with a deficit of, of common spaces for communities. These are some images of the city. This is a central part. This is how we treat the central part of the city. Um, that we have huge problems with redesigning, redeveloping the central part of the city as people moves out to suburbs. And this would be an example uh, of the strongest community base in Monterey being uh, uh, the backyard of your house, uh, the patio. Uh, the patio or the backyard is essential uh, to a Mexican family. Uh, in fact, it never looks as beautiful as in these pictures. Uh, <laughs> you would know if you had gone there that <coughs> it's, it's a place, but it is a place where you meet with your friends uh, and where you meet making a barbecue uh, the barbecue in Monterey is absolutely essential, and it always <coughs> takes place uh, in, in one of these backyards. It's not supposed to be beautiful. Uh, it's sort of like the men is in, are in charge of the meat making, the barbecue, and the women are in charge of everything else in a separate group, and the children are running around there uh, between the two groups. But that is, that is where you make strong communities. Also because <coughs> the communities in Mexico are very family related, uh, especially in the big cities. The family s tend to stick together very strongly. Uh, a lot of, in a lot of uh, living areas, the, um, the, sons, the, the, the sons will try to buy a house near their parents' house uh, to be able to stay close to the family. So it's not really uh, a big <coughs> human uh, community-based community, based community uh, society. Uh, it's, it's a lot more family-based. Nevertheless, I would, like, uh, I would like to present a few things that I have been making um, or I'm working on with my students in order to make stronger communities, because there is a uh, there is problems when when these living areas get too poor. Uh, so you need to try to make some design-related solution so that they get stronger. Uh, the first example of my students' work that I'll present to you. Uh, is a, is a project that we're currently doing. So I cannot show you the final results, uh, but we're doing it um, on uh, a basis of crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, it's very, very easy. It's about natural surveillance, territorial reinforcement, natural access control, and target hardening. Uh, it's four simple rules that is created 
to try to make neighborhood, neighborhoods more secure and more livable. We're doing this project with the state government and hopefully uh, one of them uh, has, will have a chance to be developed. I'll show you these slides very quickly because it's from the students' work and there was really no uh, opportunity to, tr to make the introduction, so it's all in Spanish. This is from uh, a neighborhood next of the uh, next of the city center, uh, and it's uh, the place of like uh, ten uh, a thousand families. Okay, you have the site here, inside the city. You have the center of the city it's here, and this project is taking place just on the other side of the big river I showed you on a previous uh, photo. And this is how it works, uh, the density of the place. Sort of the analysis of a place, you can see some pictures. Uh, it's a sort of strange mix between these huge uh, road systems and then something much more local, much much smaller space, but with with problems of uh, of absolute housing. The other thing is that inside this neighborhood is the Cathedral of Guadalupe. As you might know, the Guadalupe is the most um, famous virgin of Mexico, and is celebrated each December very heavily. So all this area will be filled with pilgrims that, that comes to, to Fangs, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe for several, several things happened during the year. So it will be filled by people in December. This is also how it looks. And you have all these strange places or it's too filled, or it's too crowdy, or it's an open space with nothing in it. It's obviously a mixed place uh, with all these kind of different ways to try to make a living more or less legal. The housing is also very poor in some of the areas. So what they're trying to do is that they're trying to, to take the whole area. This group is going to make a new park in this area uh, and to, to provide new housing facilities, uh, better housing, uh, and to try to make a much better designed uh, district in front of the cathedral, because it will get filled every year, and it has a, a huge potential for being much more uh, uh, official shopping area, and to make uh, an important entrance to the zone. This is of the same area, you see the same photos. Um, and of course, uh, this type of urban images doesn't help on security on places like this. So, And especially with these huge needs of uh, new urban facilities for for making sports and for playing. Uh, this is a place, there's a huge area here which is being used for nothing and of course the groups are trying to make it into a, a park for this place. Because obviously it's a poor area and uh, there is a lack of security and lack of jobs and, and in general a huge lack of opportunities.
for, for especially the young people living there. Just try to pass them rapidly. There's different uses of, of the area where they have small shops, uh, where they have uh, the, the way of using the road system, etc. On the other side of this river is the, the official part of Monterey uh, being here, the, the local government, uh, the art museum in, in all the strip of this Grand Plaza. This is a very small but most touristic part that we have uh, in the city. And the other is the same place, uh, but a little bit. I'm sorry. This is in 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 the, in the same project, uh, design for prime, crime prevention, in a place called Guadalupe, that is also part of the Monterey area. The the issue with this program is that it's hopefully going to be a pilot program for a lot of of the communities in Monterey. So you have a beautiful river, uh, and then you have this small community uh, just beside that. Started out as uh, a community of, of people who just took over the land, uh, and it has been re uh, made a regular, regular, being incorporated in the city uh, lately. We found out working with the area that it has been uh, occupied by a group of Indians from south of Mexico also, um, which has, was later moved. Some statistic information. And then you have here the area. And the most interesting thing about it is this connection with, with, this, with this small river and to try to reuse the, the place. sort of photos of the place, which can be quite depressive. Uh, not, not as bad as it looks, actually, but it is critical from time to time. This group has the idea of making a filter uh, of actions uh, in order to, to try to make uh, an, a, new, a new community there. They're going to try to start uh, cleaning up the place uh, just taking away the graffiti uh, and trying to make it look better. Solving problems uh, of lightning, uh, m making small projects, uh, much cheaper projects for the community, but with an immediate effect on that community. Uh, and then the idea is uh, when they start, they do that. Uh, they'll start all over the circle of the filter again. Uh, the next pro project is uh, a project on uh, a community called Genaro Vasquez. Uh, this is still a squatter community uh, inside of the city of Monterey, and what we attacked there was to try to uh, deal with the entrance which is here, the street, and the small plaza, uh, because the housing facility doesn't leave you room to do things closer to the house. So we try to, to see things from the outside, uh, trying to make uh, small uh, improvements through the, the, the only real public space in Monterey, which is from the street level, so that it would be uh, much, m much more improved, this direction to their houses.
before to have a small, how do you call this, small sideways between houses uh, to try to make them into a small, beautiful place instead of having just uh, the poor ground lay laying there. This was done uh, with a seven step program in order, the idea was to, to do it so they, the, the neighbors could do it by themselves. We didn't do any of these projects because it's still illegal, the, 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 the neighborhood. So the government would not uh, pay for any of the improvements. That is a huge problem. Uh, when you work with communities, especially in a third world, you have to make sure that they're legal. Because if they're not legal, uh, you won't have any uh, government funding at all. Because they, they take a piece of land and just construct there. And that makes it very hard uh, uh, to, to realize this. Because the, the original owner of, of the land is using it as pressure to do some other projects. Just f going to end up with a few slides of the city of tomorrow, uh, or the community of tomorrow. Well, this is still well, one of the problems of the present city. It doesn't matter where it is, uh, in fact. This is Shanghai. And these photos could be anywhere uh, in the world. What is so interesting about this is that you can see the old part of Shanghai uh, without any vegetation and a high density. And in the new parts that are much bigger, uh, you have a lot of vegetation and a low density. And of course, the result is something like this. We have traffic problems, all this type of things. Um, we have problems with the image, um, but I think I think we have to begin looking at communities and cities in a much more flexible way, like this project. Uh, I don't know where it is. I I just saw the pictures and and I really I really was interested by them, thrilled by them, because of this. <laughs> okay. It's like, it's like a baseball stadium somewhere in, an obsolete baseball stadium in somewhere in Asia. And it turns out to be a small living community where it's all shopping mall, its own shopping mall around here. I, I think that, that the future city and the future communities has to start looking for solutions where you don't see them where you don't have them. Because uh, the, the normal politics is to see every person as an individual. We get much more individual things, personal computer, personal, lap, uh, personal phones, etc. But I think that we have to also think a little bit about how we want to live together. If we don't do that, I think it's very difficult to be uh, to be living uh, so many millions of people together in the same place. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a couple of questions that people would like to ask questions. Stacy. Yeah. Uh, where the groups of peoples would get together and yeah. create, actually create a community before it was actually built. And, mm, uh, it's a mix. 